take 195 by in all probability, unlike the Queen, whose Christmas broadcasts are not improvised, this is, and you'll, you'll be able to feel me cantering towards my first fluff. I hope there'll be more interest than seeing whether I'm going to anticipate it before you do. That was a false of thought, something the Queen doesn't have to do. But I'm thinking particularly, vividly, of the Queen's coronation year, only because it was the year that I became a drama student down in town in Bradford. And the next year, 1954, for the Christmas concert, as a fully fledged first year drama student, I descended on my Methodist schoolroom uh, the themes of this talk unlike the Queen's, are rather bold, primitive Methodism and modernism, a comparative um, analysis of their influence on the West Bowling at Bradford, uh, because this was the year that I tried modernism out on them. In the very schoolroom where I would performed my first nativity play, various little sketches in variety shows, all in the aid of the Restoration Fund, usually, just to keep the place up. It was vast, uh, really. Uh, the Primitive Methodists were had an ambition which outstripped the thirst of the locals for spirituality of their particular primitive brand. There I was, standing at the age of 17, before an audience, of, no doubt puzzled, by The Journey of the Magi by T.S. Eliot, 1926. And they were sitting on benches, but that very afternoon, almost certainly, I had dusted, just as I dusted above in the chapel, the dark chapel waiting us for us all, or some of us, to go on Sunday. Every bench. Nobody ever sat on most of the benches. I suppose 99% of the benches were never sat on. The, not the benches. 99% of the pews were never sat on, but they were always dusted by me and my father, and my mother sometimes, because he was the caretaker. But I was a visiting star. I had done the journey of the Magi, I'm sure, at a Monday morning voice class down in the town that term, and so here I was trying it out. Of course, it's an old man's poem. And I feel curiously close to that 17-year-old boy I was. I can absolutely remember precisely where I stood and how I felt and how they looked in the gloom. As I did this old man's poem. Is this perhaps the unacceptable face of modernism? By the time I was doing Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead at the National in 67. This was the state at the chapel, which was demolished the next year. A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey. And such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp the very dead of winter. And the camel's galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men, cursing and grumbling and running away, and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile, and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty, and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices ringing in our ears that this was all folly. Then at dawn, 
we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a watermill beating the darkness, and three trees on a low sky, and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel. Six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver. And feet, kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued. And arrived at evening. Not a moment too soon. Finding the place. It was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember. And I would do it again. But set down this, set down this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence, and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but I thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death. Our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. T.S. Eliot lived for a time in West Hampstead, in the middle of the Great War, or, as we must now call it, the First World War. It was the year of his fateful marriage and a proofrock. He was to say of his marriage that it gave his wife much unhappiness and that it gave him the wasteland. And some ten years before, just down the road from where I now I sit, Harold Dark became organist at Emmanuel Church, with its red brick basilican bulk nestling in commanding position alongside West End Green. And it was during Dark's tenure here in 1909 that he composed something very famous, his beautiful and much-loved setting of Christina Rossetti's poem In the Bleak Midwinter. I would like to think that the carol had its first public performance at the church on the green all those Christmases ago. On the organ, co-designed by another West Hampstedite, Walford Davis, who would succeed Elgar as master of the king's music. The Edwardian organ has been altered little over the years, and on the patch of green and the streets outside the church, there are glimpses still of the midwinter scenes familiar to Elliot and Dark and other inhabitants of that gentler, greener West Hampstead.